We've got a trinity of preachers who believe in one God. And we're bringing to you some of the finest men in this United Pentecostal Church. First of all, representing the past, Brother David Gray from San Diego, California. And they're going to follow each other immediately. When one finishes, another's going to step up. And then another steps up unless some kind of intrusion develops. After Brother David Gray, Brother Kenneth Haney, newly elected assistant district, assistant general superintendent from the Western Zone. After Brother Haney, comes our newly elected president of the Conquer's Department, Brother Brian Kinsey. We're turning loose three good, godly men on you tonight. Brother David Gray? Thank you. Everybody said praise the Lord. Well, I feel it, don't you? Praise God, praise God. It feels so good to be free. Amen. 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 You may be seated. Before I get into my brief message, let me say a few words concerning the great event we're celebrating, the merger, and the events that led up to it. By way of personal testimony, I am the son of the first oneness missionaries in Japan, born in Japan during World War No. 1. Because of health reasons, the Grays returned to the United States when I was just two years old. My first recollection is sitting on the front seat of Belvedere Tabernacle in Los Angeles, pastored by Frank York, a man God mightily used in bringing this wondrous message to the world in these last days. I suppose I heard him preach hundreds of times. What a heritage I've received. In depression times, we moved out of Los Angeles to Baldwin Park, and George Farrell was my pastor. He was the author of It's All in Him. And you know that song. In 1932, I received the Holy Ghost, was baptized in Jesus' name, called into the ministry in 1934. I got my training for the ministry under Harry Moore of Oakland, where I met my wife. We will celebrate our 59th year together next month. I started out in the ministry two weeks after we were married and have been full-time ever since. I have personally met great pioneers of the faith. Men such as Frank York, Glenn Cook, George C. Studd, Frank Bartleman, John Sheppey, C.P. Kilgore, Harry Moore, Andrew Erskine, Ben Pemberton, W.E. Stalin, Earl Poole, Howard Gaw, A.D. Gurley, F.C. McLean, L.C. Hall, W.E. Booth Cliburn, Frank Small, W.T. Witherspoon, O.F. Fogg. Lee Floyd, D.A. Height. Most of these I knew personally. I suppose I could be called a bridge connecting these great pioneers of the faith to this present generation. I was a young man at the time of the merger, and I'm thankful that I had the privilege, along with Brother Chambers, Brother Urshan, and others, to have a share in the formation of the United Pentecostal Church as a first, first youth president. And as such, uh, I've been asked to speak on from whence did we come? From whence did we come? Would you like to turn in your Bibles to Hebrews 10 and stand with me 
as we read a few verses out of this wonderful book, the Bible, God's Word. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 32 to 37. But call to remembrance the former days, in which after ye were illuminated, ye endured a great fight of affliction, partly whilst ye were made a gazing stock, both by reproaches and afflictions, and partly while ye became companions of them that were so used. For ye had compassion on me and my bonds, and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves that ye have in heaven a better and an enduring substance. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which hath great recompense and reward, for ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise for yet a little while. And he that shall come will come, and will not tarry. I like to call your attention particularly to the first few verses that I read to you, verses 32 to 34, we might term that the backward look. Verses 35 and 36 is the present look, and verse 37, a look into the future. But it's the backward look to which I call your attention. The writer of Hebrews, undoubtedly Paul, reminds them of the days of the past. And he said, call to remembrance the former times. In those days, he said, he endured a great fight of affliction. And he says, you were made a gazing star. You may be seated. Now, when Paul used the word gazing stock, it is the Greek word, the atrizo. It is the word from which our word theater comes. And it means to expose as on a stage, as a spectacle. You see, God put his men on center stage, as it were, and says, Have you seen my servant Job? Look at him. I want you to see him. And so God puts his men on center stage and tells three worlds to look at that man. He's God's man. And God has entrusted him with something that is of infinite value. Let me tell you a little about our pioneers, men such as I have mentioned, these that I've mentioned. These were men of the word. A deep conviction. They were rugged men, unafraid men. They loved the word. They loved the truth. They taught and preached everywhere. Everywhere they went. They preached and taught. They made hell hot. Judgment sure. Sin black. Heaven holy. They preached Acts 238 as God's plan of salvation. They had a revelation of divine truth. And they knew it was from God. And they gave their lives to proclaim it. They knew the mighty power of the gospel. They experienced it in their own lives. And they imparted this truth into the lives of others. And embedded into them principles of divine truth that could never leave them. They emphasized certain things that sometimes we don't emphasize as much today. Such as repentance. Heart searching. They use an expression, emptying out. Emptying out. You see, you have to get empty before you get full. And they believe that men and women need to empty out to receive what God has for them. When, when they receive the Holy Ghost, in those days it seems as though they stuck. There was no revolving door. Hallelujah. Folks got some experience because they had paid a price for it. They were bold as the lamb. They paid a price to proclaim Acts 238. God's word says they were a spectacle, a gazing stock. 
These are the caliber of men that were at the merger 50 years ago that we're celebrating today. The same basic word is used in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 9. Permit me to read that verse to you. 1 Corinthians 4, 9 tells us, For I think that God hath set forth us the apostles last, as it were, appointed to death, for we are made a spectacle. The word is theatron. It means that we are on the stage and made a spectacle unto the world and to angels and to men. And the Lord set them there. And Paul used the ancient athletic events to, throughout Scripture, throughout his writings, to describe great spiritual truths. He used the athletic events such as wrestling and running and fighting. But here he used the picture of the gladiatorial battles that were so popular in the Colosseums of the world of that day. Visit Rome in the first century. The Circus Maximus seated twice as much, twice as many as Yankee Stadium. It seated 100,000 people. And the whole empire was ransacked for elephants, and hyenas, and crocodiles, and lions, and tigers to be pitted against the prisoners of war and against the slaves and criminals and the Christians. And the most horrible of all of these displays was the Munis Gladiatorium. Blood-curdling, colorful duels of the gladiators paired off as many as 300 in the arena at one time, contesting unto the death, because this was the last event on the program. All the armor and the weapons except the small dagger were removed, and they battled not just to wound and to defeat the other fellow, but to kill him. It was a battle unto the death. So Paul said, we are made as it were. In Romans, uh, 1 Corinthians 4, 9, we are made as it were. The apostles last as if it were appointed to death. We are made a spectacle unto the world, to angels and to men. And so as Paul said, we are participants in the last act. It lasts until death. God put us here to finish the drama out. This is act three, the last one. And the last one is under death. God calls us to be worthy successors of those who preceded us. I pray that God will imbue us with the same spirit they had. To those who suffered and died, Paul was an example. He said, what mean ye to weep and to break mine heart? For I am ready not to be bound only, but also to die. For the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, God put his man on center stage, as it were. And he declares that he is a spectacle unto the world. Seems that when God would introduce a new move of God into this world, such as at Pentecost, or to take the gospel to the Gentiles, or in this era of restoration of the apostles' doctrine and practice at Azusa Street, or when he would restore in full measure the oneness, God chose men, certain men with backbone, men with courage, men who hazarded their lives for the gospel, who put everything on the line, who made business for God, it wasn't a plaything with them. It was life and death. And they intended to give all to it. Men like Stephen who was martyred. Others whose backs were in ribbons from the beatings that they received. And who rejoiced that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And so it was upon, with the pioneers of our movement. When illumination from God comes. With it comes a great responsibility. And believe me, with it also comes a fight of affliction. Let me give you an example or two of what I mean when I say this. Because this has happened in the days just gone by. 
Brother Kilgore tells the story of a meeting that they had in the little city of Kilgore, Texas, I believe it was. And in that city, as the ministers met for a council meeting, there was a knock on the door, and uh, someone answered it, and there was a man who had the cemetery, the local cemetery. And he said, uh, there's a grave here of a man that uh, was Pentecostal. He said, are you gentlemen Pentecostal? He said, yes, we are. He said, could you contribute a little money for me to repair the grave? It is sunken down, and it's out of repair. And I would like to, I would like to make it presentable. I'd like to make it a nice grave, but it's been out of repair for years, and it's sunken deep down. Would you like to contribute to this man who is a Pentecostal man? They asked his name. The name was Stovall. One of the brethren in that meeting spoke up and said, I know that man. I live in a certain on a certain farm a number of years ago. And one night, one night, there was a knock on the door. And uh, I went to the door and opened it, he said. And there was a man there that had been beaten within an inch of his life. His body was bruised, broken. He was, he was, he came with his last ounce of strength. He stumbled into the room and collapsed, beaten almost to death. We took him in. We bound up his wound. We allowed him to stay with us for several days or weeks or however long it took for him to be, for his wounds to heal, to be restored. You see, he'd been beaten by four men just over the line into Louisiana. He'd been beaten almost to death. And so when he got his strength back and is, is, he was somewhat repaired, he uh, gathered his little things together and said, I'm leaving now. I, I feel better. I'm ready to go. And the, the minister said to him, where are you going to go, Brother Stovall? He said, I'm going to go over there. He said, why do you go over there? They nearly killed you the last time you were there. He said, but they need Jesus. That's where I'm going. I'm going back where they nearly killed him. He went back there and won those poor men to the Lord and baptized them in Jesus' name, and they were filled with the Holy Ghost. My father knew that man, and I have met him in Los Angeles. We knew he was from Texas. That man is a representative of the back kind of backbone that we need today. Thank God God has men to live and stand for this gospel and give their lives if necessary. And folks, I just don't know what the future holds, but I do know this that God has men today that will stand for him no matter what the future holds. A number of years ago, in Colombia, South America, there'd never been, uh, so far as we knew, any true preach concerning the oneness of God. And a man went there by the name of Larson to Colombia, South America. And there... He began to try to preach. The doors were closed. They would not accept a Protestant. The doors were totally closed. The government was in control, uh, by control by the Roman church. And there was absolutely no freedom for anybody to come. And so he, he knew God had sent him. He found a little place to live. But no doctor would take him when he was sick. And uh, so he and his wife lived there in that little house. He tried to hold services, and they visited every home in the area that they could reach, but there was nobody that would come. And this went on for a year and two years and three years, and not one soul was saved, not one soul. But Brother Larson continued on. His wife got pregnant, and uh, 
He tried to take her to a doctor, but no doctor would accept her as a patient. She died in childbirth. No funeral home would accept her body. No mortician would accept her. No cemetery would open its arms for her to be buried. Brother Larson built a little casket in his backyard. He took the body of his wife. He placed it. In the little box that he made, set it in front of the little place where he tried to preach if he had an audience. But he preached her a funeral sermon. And then he took her out of the backyard and he buried her and put a mark at her grave. That night, the first soul came to God. The first of a deluge, a mighty revival that broke out in Colombia until the denominational world stood back in awe and wonder and wrote books about our revival in Colombia. There was a man that laid down his very life, his wife's life. It almost took his very life himself, but he gave it gladly for the cause of the Lord. Friends, this is the kind of thing that God's word says, call to remembrance the former days when he endured a great fight of affliction. Remember them. Remember we're built on that kind of foundation. Don't ever forget it. There was a price paid for you to be here tonight. Hallelujah. Somebody paid a price for you to be saved. Somebody laid their lives on the line. Somebody said, I'm going to preach this no matter what happens. No matter what they take my life from me, I'll still preach it. That's why we're here tonight. And that's why God has placed upon us a great responsibility. This is our heritage. Let us be worthy successors of it. Even today we have men right here in this great convention who represent the very thing I'm talking about. Brother Petromarian from Ethiopia had his baby in his arms. The communist came, broke open the door, snatched the baby out of his arms, and dashed his head against the wall. Brother Petromarian has the joy of the Lord in his life and heart. He need to pay the price for what he's got. And as a result, friends, a great revival has broken out in Ethiopia. Price was paid for that. Blood was shed. Lives were put on the line. But God sent forth his word, and men with backbone carried it to the lost world. Let's praise the Lord together. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Call to remembrance. The former days, for he endured a great fight of affliction. He were, as it were, on stage, and God said, look at him. He's my man. He's going to live for me. You can do what you want to with him, devil, but he's my man. And you can't take out of him what I have put into him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And God has us on center stage now. And it's our job to be worthy of those who went before us. And by the grace of God, hallelujah, to stand until Jesus comes. Shall we say praise the Lord. God bless you in Jesus' name. Put our hands together, brothers and sisters. Let's thank God for our past, our heritage, our roots. If you will remain standing, Brother Gray, I deeply appreciate that. And I thank God for our elders that have given to us such a marvelous foundation to build upon. 
My subject tonight is the present, the present God. We're dealing with the past, the present, and the future. I would like to call your attention to the Gospel of John, chapter 11. If you would turn with me and you have your Bible. And I will read beginning with verse 19. And many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary sat still in the house. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. But I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it to thee. Jesus saith unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. Martha said unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life, and he that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Verse 35, Jesus wept. Then said the Jews, Behold how he loved him. And some of them said, Could not this man, which opened the eyes of the blind, have caused that even this man should not have died? Jesus, therefore, again groaning in himself, cometh to the grave. It was a cave, and a stone lay upon it. Jesus said, Take ye away the stone. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, saith unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he hath been dead for days. Would you lift a hand and let's praise God for just a moment. Father, we praise you. We thank you that you are the resurrection in life. We thank you for yesterday. And we thank you for the present, and we thank you for what you're going to be tomorrow. For this is the day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice in it. And I pray that the anointing of the Holy Ghost will come upon this preacher for the next few moments, and we will expound uh, the Word of God, and we will give you the praise and honor in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. You may be seated. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. I'm here to declare to you tonight that the God of yesterday is the God of today, and the God of today is going to be the God of tomorrow. I'm concerned about the day that I'm living in. I did not live in the past. I thank God for the tremendous heritage that we have. I am a third generation in Pentecost. In fact, Brother David Gray is my uncle. It is my mother's brother. I thank God for his leadership and influence on my life, as well as the influence of my own father and countless men of God that have laid a great example for myself and others. But I'm here tonight to declare to you that God is God now. Hallelujah. And he's the God of revival and the God of miracles and the God of the supernatural. We do not serve an antiquated God. Our God is alive forever and forever and forever and forever and forever. Praise God. And tonight I want to bring to you the setting of the scripture. Jesus had come. Lazarus is dead and buried. And Martha comes to greet the Lord before he arrives at the home. And Martha is uh, conversing with Jesus. And Jesus is telling her, Martha, your brother shall rise again. And Martha is looking into the future. And she is saying, I know that he'll rise again in the resurrection of the last days. She was looking into the future. There are some folks among us even tonight that everything is tomorrow. But I want you to know, brothers and sisters, it is now that God wants to work amongst us. This is the day of salvation. This is the hour of miracles. You can have from God what you desire from God. This is the precise moment. She said, yes, Lord, I know that in the resurrection of the last day, and as they moved a little closer, the Jews came. And they said, could not this man who opened the blinded eyes, they were living in the past. And they were saying, of yesterday, he was the one that opened the blinded eyes and stopped the deaf ears, healed the crippled limbs, did all of these wonderful things. If he would have been here, everything would have been all right. But they did not understand 
that the resurrection and life was talking you with them right that moment. I want to tell you right now, the God of the Brush Arbor, the God of Susa Street, the God of Pentecost is with us now, this very moment, not tomorrow, but now. Oh, put your hands together, shout unto the Lord. of revival. God wants to do great and mighty things. He said, where are you ladies? They took him up to the old family cemetery. The stone was in the way. And I'll just go through this for a moment. He said, take me away the stone. And I could preach a whole message on this right now. But some of you start need to start rolling stones right now. You've got a lot of stones in the way of what God wants to do. You need to get a hold of them and roll them away. God has the power to speak them away because he's God. He can speak them into total oblivion. But let me tell you tonight, he'll never do for you what you can do for yourself. You need to move all doubt and unbelief out of you and roll the stone away and roll it away now. For he is the resurrection and the life. This is the day of miracle. This is the day of revival. Hallelujah. Modern knowledge, technology, medical science. Can you imagine what has transpired in one century of time? 100 years ago, before an automobile, there was a horse in the back. My grand, great great grandfather, Alex Lee, left the state of Iowa right where we're at and came by wagon train to the good old West California and settled in 1862, but it took him three months to get them from Iowa because it was rugged terrain, it was prairie, it was disassembling wagons, letting them over cliffs, uh, it was forging ahead uh, to the west. But I flew here in three hours and 20 minutes. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are living in a day of modern technology. Uh, Brother Gray's parents, my grandparents, uh, sailed in the early 1900s for Japan. They spent 40 years of their life as missionaries in Japan. It took them one month by boat to leave America and arrive in Japan. Today, we can be there in 10 and a half hours. We're talking about a day when you can fly from the West Coast to the East Coast in five hours. And you can fly around the world in approximately 17 hours. We're living in a day when they put men on the moon. Uh, everything, this is modern technology. Uh, this is the day of internet. Uh, this is the day of mass communication. Uh, it doesn't take us to go by boat hours and days and months as the Apostle Paul. Uh, we can fly from one continent to another, leave one continent in the morning, preach that night in another continent, and go to another continent uh, and preach the next night. Uh, this is a great day, church. Uh, it's not a day of the curse. It's a day of the blessing. This is the day of the resurrection and life. It's our day. It's the day of revival. It's the day of the meeting of the Spirit. A few months back, approximately nine months ago, one of the men of our congregation, by the name of Ray Spirit, had a degenerative heart. A heart that was failing and only given a few days to live. He was admitted to Stanford University. And they said the only way, sir, that you can live is for us to find a donor and put a brand new heart on the inside of you. He laid in that hospital and waited for four weeks. At one o'clock in the morning, my phone rang. And it was from Stanford. They said, we have a patient over here that's nurse. We have a donor. And in four and a half hours, we're going to put that heart in this man, and he wants a preacher to be by his bedside. I, I put on my clothes, jumped in my car, drove to Stanford. I stood by his bedside, and I said, Ray, God is with us. God is going to see you through. I'm happy to tell you that they performed the surgery. He has another heart, not the heart that was given when he was born, but it's another man's heart. But today, nine months later, He's walking, he's talking, he's feeling good, uh, and he has a brand new heart. This is the day of modern technology. Uh, knowledge will increase. Uh, church, we better get with the time. Uh, we better move with the hour. Uh, this is our day. Uh, evangelize, 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 uh, and reach the world. This is our hour. I'm not playing for you, 
Some folks are praying for it. We're in the middle of revival. I said, I'm not praying for revival. I'm praying to get in shape where God can use me. We're in the middle of revival. You don't have to pray for electricity. It's there. You need to plug in so you can get the vacuum to work. That's right. There are too many folks pushing a vacuum with no power. But we got power, ladies and gentlemen. Plug in. This is the hour. This is our day. It's the present. God is doing great things. Some of you like the fellow that I heard about that went down and bought a chainsaw because he wanted to cut some wood. Took a brand new, beautiful chainsaw home. And the second day, after he had made it so hard, he called up the fellow down at the store and he said, I can't get this thing. And he said, I'm just working myself to death. He said, it just doesn't seem to work right. He said, well, Jerry, just bring it in, sir. He brought it in. The fellow looked down and said, everything looks fine to me. He pulled the, turned the button on, pulled the cord, and the power went to go, and then the motor started bucking. The fellow said, what was just that noise? You see, we've got a lot of folks today that have never pulled the plug, never pushed it in, don't have the power. They're trying to do it too hard. The power's there, the miracle power there. This is revival. Plug it in, turn it on, get it to work. This is our hour. Don't wait for another day. This is the moment. The present hour. The hour of revival. Brother Gray alluded to something. The great revival of tonight. I want to tell you, Senator Lugas, you need to see tonight. In America, things have drastically changed in the last 35 years. This is a day when immigrants from all around the world have migrated to the United States of America. The ethnic, the minority, are not going to be in the minority much longer. In the state of California, in three more years, 51% of that state will be ethnic. And there's too many of us that are set in our own prejudiced way. We will not evangelize. But I'm going to tell you, this is the hour. The church must be agile. The church must be flexible. The church must move. This is our day. There's receptivity there. There's hunger. There's yearning. There's desire. Holy Bible. This is our day. It is our hour. Oh, God, help us. It's not just in America. It's around the world. Everywhere. Yes, Brother Gray, it is so. Brother J.J. JJ, would stand up there. Brother J.J., our general superintendent from Papua New Guinea. Here's a man six years ago with a oneness, Jesus name, tongue talking population in Papua New Guinea of about 5,000 people. Today, it is 57,000 people. I want to tell you, this is the hour of revival. Quit belly aching about what God is and, and start praising him for what he is. Let's not always live in the past or the future. Let's live in the now. The now. The present and the now. Take this. Penny cost was great. 120, 3,000, 5,000. Fill Jerusalem with your doctor. 17th chapter, these that have turned the world upside down have come here also. 16th chapter, in two, the space of two years, all of Asia heard the word. But let me tell you something. Try this in one day. In Papua New Guinea, Billy Cole, evangelist, goes to one meeting. In one day, 7,000 receive the Holy Ghost. This is the present I'm talking. This is not back yonder. This is now. Everybody say now. Now. I'm convinced you can have a revival if you want revival. But there's a price to be paid, and that's the plugging in, fasting, praying. It doesn't do me any good to talk about it unless I give you the application. Preach it. Talk it. Plug in. Fast. Pray. Street meetings. Prison meetings. Bus ministry. Door to door. Prayer meetings. We can have it. There's a price to be paid. Brother Gray told us about that price. If it took such a price to have revival 50 years ago, the price is still the same, but the benefits are incredible for our house. Brother Peckham, has already been to churches. I don't know. Churches are all there. 
El Salvador has two dollars. But again, one day. I'm talking about one day. One day, ladies and gentlemen. Within a few minutes, within a few hours, 78,000 in a true phase again under the influence of a man don't like Billy Cole that God is using 78,000 to receive the Holy Ghost. Some of you saying, I'm not sure about it. Come on now. Come on. That's your skepticism. That's why you don't have revival. That's why you're not being blessed of God. Move that skepticism out of the way. Start rejoicing in what God is doing. I love it. That's why there's revival. There's excitement. There's joy. Come on. Get off your high horse, my friend. Let's have an hour of rejoicing in God. This is the present. The Andalamo but I haven't heard much preaching on the fire. And until we get the fire burning, this church today needs a baptism of fire that will burn in the heart of every member of our constituency. A fire that will explode. That's called first love. Brothers and sisters, I propose to you that it's wonderful to live in the present. Some have said they wanted to live when Moses lived and God parted the Red Sea. And others wanted to march around the walls of Jericho. And some wanted to live in the times of Christ when he ministered in such beautiful way. And others said, oh, how grand it would be to have been in the upper room of the day of Pentecost. And some have even said, I wish I had lived as they did. But if I had a choice, I thank God it's now. This is the day the Lord hath made. Right in this auditorium, I don't think we need to even put it off till we get back home. I think God can pour out his spirit in this place right now. And anybody that needs a healing touch, anybody that needs the Holy Ghost, can be filled before they walk out of this place. You may be seated. There's a powerful anointing on the United Pentecostal Church today. A greater anointing than I've ever felt in my lifetime. The reason I attribute to this anointing is that we're more focused on a common goal. That goal is the evangelizing of our world with the only message that can save. We have heard the voice of Pentecost past. Thank you, Brother Gray, for an awesome message tonight. We've heard the cry of Pentecost present. Brother Haney has opened to us the windows of opportunities that we have today. But it's my job tonight to sound the trumpet of Pentecost future. Or better yet, Pentecost continues. When the book of Acts was started, it started with what Jesus began both to do and to teach. And the apostles' ministry was simply a continuation of what they saw Jesus say and do. But when the book of Acts ended, it ended with Paul preaching the kingdom and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ. With all confidence, no man forbidding him. There was no end to the book of Acts. No doxology, no benediction, not even a good old amen. The only appropriate ending would be three words, to be continued. There's only one appropriate response to what we've heard about the past and the present, and that is to be continued. There is absolutely no reason for this church to end its revival fire now. We began this thing in the spirit. There is no reason for us to end it in the flesh. There's no reason for us to end it without that burning passion of fire in our spirit. It's time for us not to apostate and to turn cold. It's time for us to burn up for Jesus Christ in this hour. I want to know how many of you wants it to continue. It's time.
started in a place of glory. And I'm not going to sit around and let it die. When there's still a praise in my spirit, uh, there's still a pep in my step, uh, there's still something in my heart that says God still has something great for this organization. We're not going down. We're going to have a Holy Ghost, Jesus' name, revival. But I propose to you tonight, if Pentecost is going to continue, we need three anointings found in the Scripture, and we need them desperately. And I want to acquire those anointings in this place here tonight. In Leviticus chapter 14, we find the leper's anointing. is the only one outside of the ministry, the priesthood, who's allowed to experience the anointing. And there is a specific purpose. He receives this anointing, and it is for his atonement. There is an anointing in the atonement. Whenever you know that you are saved, that your sins have been washed away by the power of the blood, there's an anointing that comes on you when you experience the atonement. I refuse to use my anointing to beat people up. I'm not here to beat anybody up with my anointing. I'm not here to put anybody down, but I'm here to save them with the gospel of Jesus Christ. I preach hell, and I still preach on hell, even today as an evangelist. But I don't preach on hell to put people there. I preach on hell to pull them out. I don't preach to beat people up, but I preach to see them atoned by the only message that can save them. I do preach repentance, water baptism in Jesus' name, the infilling of the Holy Ghost. If you still believe that message works today, I think we need to get a hold of an anointing when we preach it. I'm not mad. I'm not aggravated. As a matter of fact, I'm rejoicing in what my Holy Ghost has done for me. I've been washed in the blood of the Lamb, and I want people to be turned around. I think there needs to be a joy in our hearts when we preach this atonement. I think that we need to rejoice in it. I went to Brother Barnes several years ago, and I said, Brother Barnes, I want a new level of power, and I want to see greater results in my preaching. And I said, I want you to tell me what's wrong. What do I need to do? And he sat me down, and he pointed his finger in my face, and he said, Brian, you don't enjoy the battle anymore. And he said, I want you to understand that every morning when you wake up, you got to pull the sword from the sheath and get prepared to fight. If you have no stomach for the battle and you don't delight in the battle, you'll never win the victory. He said, because if you do make it and you step through the pearly gates, and you listen to them close behind you, listen carefully. You're going to hear the arrows of the devil as they bounce off because he's never going to give up till you make it all the way over there. But you remember one thing. The devil's always got to come up with something new to defeat you, but you don't have to come up with anything new to whip him. What whipped him in the wilderness of temptation will whip him right now. It doesn't make any difference where you go, whether it's Ethiopia or whether it's right here in North America. The same message, the same gospel, the same Jesus. It will work to defeat the enemy right now. I believe there's an anointing in the atonement. I want to know how many of you have been saved. How many of you have been water baptized in Jesus' name? Some of you act like you don't care about that. Your name has been written in the Lamb's book of life. You ought to be jumping up and down. If Jesus were to come tonight, you're not going to burn in hell, but you're going to make heaven. That's the reason why Ethiopia's got a revival. They still get excited about the atonement. Man of God preach about the propitiation of sins. I think it's time we get excited about what that mercy seat represents. The fact that my sin has been taken away and God's judgment has been removed. There's an anointing in the atonement. Go ahead and preach it. Preach it right. Preach that name because there's power in that name. I think I'm just going to enjoy the battle. I think I'm going to rejoice in what my Jesus has done. He's purchased for me salvation at Calvary. By a shed blood, I can stand before this congregation and tell you, I am a child of God. There's an anointing in that.
In Lamentations chapter 2 and verse 12, we got to understand that this anointing is for atonement. In Lamentations chapter 2 and verse 12, we find the children swooning as the wounded in the street, crying and pouring their souls. The Bible says they poured their souls out to their mothers, crying, where is the corn and the wine? They were crying for the corn and the wine. Now, In the future, and even now, we are going to preach to a wounded generation. You can't get any good sinners any longer. They're all messed up. Their minds are messed up. The humanistic society that we live in has tortured them and twisted their thinking. And when they come to our churches, they come hurting and they come wounded. And if there's anything they need, they need an apostolic message that can change their life. But you know what? I believe men can walk in our churches alcoholics and walk out sober men by the power of this anointing. They're going to come swooning. They're going to come without direction. But I still believe the United Pentecostal Church has corn and wine for the wounded. There's three reasons why Mama does not have corn and wine. The first thing is that she's got a breach. There are gaps and holes that cannot be healed. I want you to know that there can be no gap between what we preach and what we live. I said there can be no gap between what we preach and what we live. There can be no holes in our dedication to the Lord in this hour. We are anointed to bring atonement to this world. I don't want to preach prayer and not do it. I don't want to preach worship and then sit on the platform or sit back there in the congregation and not do it. I don't want to preach one thing and then do something else. But I want to live what I preach. My God, don't bless it anybody for not worshiping while you're doing the thing and then you sit back and not do anything yourself. My God, if there's ever an hour, we need to all humble ourselves before the mighty hand of God and say, I don't care who's preaching. I've got to see God move. Somebody's crying for corn and wine. There's a second reason why Mama didn't have any corn and wine, and you find in verse 14 in the same chapter of Lamentations 2, she would not allow the ministry to discover her iniquity. We still need preaching against sin. We still need preaching on repentance. We will have no future if we can't handle the sin of this generation. And I can't handle it with anger, but I can't handle it with anointing. Get mad at it because, friend, getting mad at it's not going to change anything. But there is an anointing that brings atonement. And I feel that anointing in this place right now. And God's wanting to anoint the United Pentecostal Church with corn and wine. I think we ought to turn the pulpit loose and let him preach against sin that's found in this good old black back book called the Bible. Preach it. If I'm not praying, then tell me about it. If I'm not doing right, tell me about it. I want to know. But people don't want you to touch sin anymore. But I'm going to tell you, we need a sin-killing revival before we're going to have a Holy Ghost revival. But if this anointing ever gets a hold of us just right and God deals with our sin, there is no limit. I said there's no limit to what we're going to see happen. Hallelujah. The third reason is there's no corn and wine is because the prophet can't find out the real reason why they're in captivity. And if the prophet can't find out why we're not having revival and tell us why we're not having it, then we'll never be able to correct the right thing so we can get it. But there is an anointing that can come on us to give us an understanding. If we're not having revival, why aren't we? And if we're not having a move of God, then why is it? And if we believe that my God can open our understanding to why we're not having it and correct the right things, then we can straighten up what has been crooked so we can see 
what God wants to give us. I'll tell you one thing in my spirit right now that I can feel in the Holy Ghost that God wants to put on us a new joy for the battle. We are too traumatized by all of our battles. We talk about the persecution that the Ethiopians have experienced and consequently they've experienced revival. But I want you to know the persecution didn't bring that revival. I've seen people persecuted before that never got revival. Their response to their persecution has brought them revival. It's how they react to it. We get a little trouble in our lives and we, we just go nuts for six weeks and the preacher's got to do therapy for six months to get us back in a revival mode. That's ridiculous. I said, that's absolutely ridiculous. But we got to do therapy for six months to get people that are full of the Holy Ghost baptized in Jesus' name. You ought to be ready for the greatest Holy Ghost revival right now. I want this thing to continue. And yes, we're going to have some battles in the future, but we can't get traumatized over every battle we fight. We got to face it with joy. We got to face it with power and with confidence. There's a second anointing, and we need this second anointing if we're going to realize the potential of our future. And it's found in Exodus chapter 40, and it's the anointing that's given to the priest. There's a specific reason, and that is to minister to the Lord. I believe that if we're going to realize a future, we've got to build a personal relationship with Jesus Christ of inner integrity. Where it's not just something external that I feel when Brother Haney got up here to preach that motivated me to worship. But there is something internalized. There's something on the inside that says it's now or it's never. I just want to know, do you believe the apostolic message is the message of salvation? And if you do, it's all that matters. We can't play games. People are crying to mama right now saying, Mama, do you have any corn? Do you have any wine? I want to be able to say, yes, I've got a relationship with Jesus. I can't heal you, but I know somebody who can. I can't set you free, but I know somebody who can. A personal walk with God. Sometimes we spend whole church services getting people ready to do the work of the Lord. I think we ought to come to church like we end up church most of the time. I said, I think we ought to come to church like we end up most of the time. What would it be if we just started on Sunday morning when we got back to church, back to our home churches, and we're just as anointed when we start as we are right now? Oh, we don't need another external little program or something to stimulate us. You ought to have a personal relationship with God that brings its own anointing. I want it to continue. But there's a third anointing. And it's the king's anointing. The first time it was ever used is when Samuel anointed Saul. This is the only anointing that's got a question mark put to it. In other words, it's not a sure thing. All the other anointings, the atonement, the priestly anointing, they're everlasting. They're sure. But the king's anointing is a question. Is it not, I've anointed you king over Israel, is it not because the Lord hath anointed thee to be captain of his inheritance? So that means that Saul was going to determine how he would use his anointing. There are some anointings that come on us that we can use them any way we want to. Saul, if you want to fight David for the rest of your life, and that's what you want to use your anointing for, that's what it'll be. But you'll end up being slain by the enemy. But if you want a David who said, I'm not going to use my anointing even against those who curse me. I refuse to use my anointing against anybody. But I'm going to use my anointing against the Philistines and against the powers of darkness and against the forces.
Gott ist am Herr. I want you to know it's a question mark. And I ask you the question, United Pentecostal Church, my God has given us a, a kingly anointing. What are you going to do with it? I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to come against every force of darkness in the name of Jesus. I want to see every local church turned on for revival. I don't care who's growing. I don't care how many get the Holy Ghost. I don't care if they're just kids. Thank God for it. I even like kids getting the Holy Ghost. If this thing is going to continue, we've got to have corn and wine in the crib. And for my final point, and I'm closing, there was only one time in the life of Jesus where he danced over his disciples. And I'm talking about literally. Luke 10, 17. It was when the 70 returned with a report of what their preaching was doing in the cities where they had taken their message and saw demons cast out and saw Satan falling out of heaven like lightning. Jesus said in that hour, Jesus rejoiced. That word rejoice is agileo. We get our word agile from, which means to jump or to move in very quick motion. Similar to what you see Brother Tekla Marion do, that's a good example of agileo or agile. Whenever you see him dance, he's always kind of moving around in little quick squirts. Well, that's just the way, that's just the way the word is. Jesus got all excited when the disciples finally realized they had authority over the powers of darkness. We don't have to sit around and be traumatized over every little crisis that comes along. We got authority to do something about it. We are captains of the Lord's inheritance. And God's saying, just how much of this blessing do you want? Just how much of this Holy Ghost do you want? Just how much of this revival do you want? Take it. He started dancing. I tell you, when the United Pentecostal Church starts taking Philadelphia's and Boston's and New York City's and bringing the strongholds down and Vancouver's and seeing Holy Ghost revival, Jesus is going to leap from his throne and he's going to dance over this church. And this church is going to find out that not only do we dance, but God also dances. And when Jesus starts dancing over this church, Satan's going to fall. The kingdom of darkness is going to fall. Not everybody's going to be saved, but we might as well save all we can while we can. I got sense enough to know everybody's not going to heaven. I also got sense enough to know that I'm going to do everything I can to get everybody to heaven. That I can while I can. Brother Gray, Brother Haney, this thing's going to continue. I said, this thing's going to continue. To be continued. Last thing, I found it in a Catholic hymnal at a funeral home. Greg Britton gave it to me. The Lord of the Dance. It's a song the Catholics still sing today. I danced in the morning when the world was begun. I danced in the moon and the stars and the sun. I came down from heaven and I danced on the earth at Bethlehem. I danced for the scribe and the Pharisee, but they wouldn't dance and they wouldn't follow me. But I danced for the fishermen, for James and John. They came with me and the dance went on. I danced on the Sabbath and I cured the lame. But the holy people said it was a shame. They whipped and they stripped and they hung me on high. And they left me there on a cross to die. But I danced on a Friday when the sky turned black. I don't care how black it is. I don't care how down it is. You got a God that danced on his darkest day. The devil couldn't keep him down. Death could not hold him. Don't tell me the powers of darkness are any mess for this book of Acts. Second chapter. 38 message. 
I danced on a Friday when the sky turned black. It's hard to dance with the devil on your back. They buried my body and they thought I'd gone. But I am the dance and I still go on. They cut me down, but I leap up high. I am the life that'll never die. I'll live in you if you'll live in me. I am the Lord of the dance, said he. If God ever starts dancing over the United Pentecostal Church, there won't be enough devils in hell to stop the influx of people into our churches, wounded, crying in the streets, because there's going to be corn and there's going to be wine. And mama's got it. I said, mama's got it. I believe mama's got the corn. Because when God starts dancing, he's going to bring back the backslider. I've seen it. Get ready for it. Get your attitude ready for it. God's going to bring the backslider back. I can feel it crumbling. Lost loved ones. They're going to find out there's nothing out there in that world. I want every one of these anointings. Question is, is it not to make you captain over God's inheritance? The captain always leads his troops to battle to bring about whatever spoil, victory, or possession that might allow. And I ask you this question. Are we going to go to battle? Are we going to start enjoying it? Instead of being traumatized by every little thing that comes along? And possess our inheritance. Brother Gray talked about men that left us a marvelous heritage. I want to realize every blessing of it. There's people in this building right now that need miracles in your life. You're wounded. You need the Holy Ghost. You need some corn. And you need some wine. And you come crying to the right mama. You've come crying to the right mama. And if you need a miracle in your life, now I feel a move of the Holy Ghost here. Now let's don't take this lightly. If you really need a miracle and you believe that God's going to do something great in your life, I want you to walk to this front right now. And I want you to come up here and believe God for your miracle. If you need the Holy Ghost, you've never spoke with tongues of the Spirit of God gives you the utterance. I want you to walk up here right now. I want you to walk up here right now. It's not over with yet. Ethiopian revival was powerful, but it's to be continued. Book of Acts revival. Last year we had 101 service. Get the Holy Ghost. It's to be continued. That's what our future holds. A continuation. It's the same ministry. The same power and the same gospel. Same effect, same anointing, same atonement, same relationship. A relationship that is so beautiful. But what are we going to do with the last anointing? It's up to us. We've got a question mark. How are you going to use it? I want to be the captain of the Lord's inheritance. And with that anointing, rightfully belongs to me in redemption, the propitiation, the mercy seat. Now, we really need altar workers. I don't know how many of you need the Holy Ghost. I don't know how many of you need miracles. But I guess what we need to do right now is we need to start laying hands on one another and start praying for one another. Now, I know everybody can't get down here, but you can lay hands on somebody standing around you, if you would, all over this building, everywhere you're at, if you would start praying one for the other. The Holy Ghost wants to move. The power of God wants to set free. Let the anointing come on you right now.